I've lectured and I've written about and I've talked about this whole idea of, of materiality and meaning many times and I hardly ever know where, where to begin or even what to say because it really is a subject, um, I mean, the way material means is, is, is really uh, uh, comes out of having a tacit knowledge um, of, of, of it, that is knowing about it in a way that cannot really be written or communicated about through words or, or through symbols. Um, it's, it's directly connected with instinct, I think. And um, it's something innate which goes deeper um, um, than, we, than how we behave through more learned experience. Um, what, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about some ideas having to do with this thing, materiality and meaning, but then I'm going to show, show the work of about 10 different artists who I think um, 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 really re reflect some of these ideas. But um, um, it's a, a behavior that's often, um, th those who are practitioners of art, that is the artists themselves, are usually much more um, connected to this idea than critics and those who kind of um, um, uh, write about, about the medium. But those of us who allow ourselves to be directly influenced by materiality and the physical world, instinct is a behavior that I think we, es we especially trust. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting um, um, writer I think one of the most most profound writers in craft media, whose name is Ellen Disignaki, and she wrote a book called What is Art For? Um, and she was written about 20 years ago, but she's possibly the first to really consider the uh, the nature of artistic behavior on a global context. She, she did what so many thought impossible, that is, she set aside preconceptions of modern Western aesthetics to consider art cross-culturally. She's really one, one of the first who actually began to think about art as, as, as something biologically driven, which is very different than the way Western art thinkers and critics think about art making. She's fully accepted the diversity of humankind. I mean, the, the rain, I mean, she didn't just focus on the na narrow precepts of Western art thinking. She really went um, to all cultures to kind of think about what we had in common, this bioevolutionary necessity that we have in terms of trying making work. And my whole conversation here has to do, I'm coming to you not as, not as a theoretician, but as an artist. And that's a very different kind of point of view than, than oftentimes the way that art is spoken about. Um, instinct is fundamental, um, and it, it really is fundamental to our, our whole shared experience of what kind of goes on, especially in this media where, where expression comes out of something that I think oftentimes comes first from a connection to, to, the, to the physical world. Um, thinking about instinct um, really relates to my main focus of this talk. Um, for years I've been torturing myself trying to, trying to figure out um, this, this phenomenon of materiality as I see. You know, when I work with students, especially younger students, this behavior, this need that artists have to connect with the physical world is something that is really exciting to watch. And especially, again, the, the, newer, the, the, the younger the artist, it seems in a way there's something naive and fresh and really exciting to watch the way that connection occurs. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, um, you know, I, I, I think I'd rather be in my studio doing it than standing up here making words about it. But on the other hand, uh, it's really exciting to see. Where, everywhere I look these days, and over the last numbers of years, I'm, I'm seeing work that's, that's um, writing about um, um, things relating to, to, to materiality and to the physical and, and to making things. You know, artists, cultural critics, sociologists, ne ne neurologists, philosophers. You know, philosophers, motorcycle mechanics, industrial designers, anthropologists, they're all writing about, about making things. It's, it's really kind of incredible, and it's something that's only happened within the last 10 years or so. They're all writing books weighing in about the value of working with the materials and making things by hand. Um, <clears throat> One person who's obvious, uh, has written recently and been very influential is, is the distinguished NYU and London School of Economics professor of sociology named Richard Sennett. Um, and he wrote a book called The Craftsman, which has become the rage amongst my circle of friends, but also amongst um, artists and makers um, and others who look to find uh, meaningful existence through the work that they do. In fact, he was a, he was a keynote speaker at the, at the conference in Minneapolis that we had that the American Crafts Council had uh, not too long ago. He is using craft as a model for, uh, in, for living in contemporary culture and sees it as, as an enduring basic human impulse. That is, and this is a quote, the, the desire to do a job well for its own sake. He speaks of many aspects of crafts and craftsmanship, including material consciousness, the hand, arousing tools, um, and quality-driven work. But his own greatest emphasis is on connecting physical labor to ethical values. 
He looks at craft from the Renaissance to the present, present and considers the way craftsmanship connects people to their work by conferring pride and meaning. Senate speaks in terms of today's world, whether a violin maker, a computer programmer, a doctor, a painter, or a parent. Um, that's a book that you should read if you haven't already done that. Another book um, which causes us to, us to salivate um, is a book called Shop Craft, the Soul Craft. And it's uh, <clears throat> written by Matthew Crawford, who's both a philosopher and motorcycle mechanic. Um, this guy has his PhD in political um, philosophy from the University of Chicago and owns and operates an independent motorcycle repair shop in Richmond, Virginia. Um, he, is, he is critical of the way our educational system is hustling young people off into college and into lives in corporate cu cubicles known as knowledge workers. Um, he rants about the misguided separation of thinking and doing. Uh, the work of the hand from that of the mind in an atmosphere that we live in today is clearly bias of mind over matter. Crawford is the antithesis of those who see the world as increasingly disembodied to the extent that um, some cyber geeks, some cyber geeks actually dismiss the body as, a, as dead meat and merely a container for the brain. Um, Based on personal experience, Crawford would love to restore honor to all the manual tr uh, uh, trades as a life worth, um, worth choosing. He is emphatic about the tremendous satisfaction that can come through engagement with the physical world and discusses ways in which knowledge may come to us through, through touch. He so beautifully describes his own life as a motorcycle mechanic, a job which is not only physically demanding but also engaging intellectually. In fact, he thinks of it as more engaging than jobs he has had that have been officially recognized as knowledge uh, work. Uh, but, but a, a comment he makes that's really important to me is the whole idea, it seems that Crawford's big worry is about the onset of electronic sweatshops and the concern with how computers and transforming the office of the future into, into the factory of the past. Um, uh, that is, that the modern workplace cubicle, cubicle is so often a place which deadens our senses and saps our vitality. Um, in, in this new service economy. And when I talk to my students oftentimes, I ask them why are you, why are you involved in this thing, involved, it's called, called craft and, and material studies. And um, for many, many reasons they're involved, but one thing is I, don't, I just don't want to spend my life sitting in front of that screen. But um, anyway, from the world of medicine um, comes a neurologist named Frank Wilson, and he's also done lectures for the American Crafts Council and at Haystack and other places who 10 years ago, ago uh, wrote a book called The Hand. And <clears throat> he speaks indirectly but eloquently about materiality and by discussing the way our lives, our thoughts and feelings are indelibly shaped by the knowledge which comes through, through um, the use of the hands. I mean, it's a really tough thing. Most of what I'm talking about is, 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 is an in ineffable in a certain way. It's a really tough thing to kind of talk about. His mission for writing this book, he says, was to expose, and this is a quote, the hidden physical roots of the unique human capacity for passionate and creative work. He thinks of the hands as sensors. I mean, this is an interesting quote. Um, where, when personal desire prompts anyone to learn to do something well with the hands, an extremely complicated process is initiated and endows the work with a powerful emotional charge. It is not until one touches the material as the hand begins to understand it that one's life may be changed through knowing it is right. Whether sculptor, musician, juggler, um, material artist, surgeon, um, contact um, with uh, uh, four of their, uh, their hands is a byproduct of an intense striving um, that they turn themselves into the essential physical instrument for the realization of ideas. Um, I, there's an arch uh, um, one of my favorite architects in this world is a uh, man by the name of Peter Zumthor. I don't know if you know his work, but um, <clears throat> The phenomenon of materiality emerged in a significant way um, a couple years ago when he was um, awarded the, the Pritzker Prize in architecture. Um, um, and, you know, he's working away from the mainstream. Uh, he's a materialist, I think of him as a materialist, running a small architectural office in a, in a um, wooden barn in, in Switzerland. Um, <clears throat> and he, um, but he does not fit into the mold, certainly, of celebrity architect. Deeply informed by his early training as a cabinet maker, he is a materialist, the way he conceives of a building. And it's really interesting when you th if you think about architecture. Um, people, someone like Peter Eisman, for example, thinks of, um, who was a well-known sort of cerebral architect who's interested in seeing what kind of architectural experience you will end up with if you push an idea as far as it will go. Whereas Zumpther, um, more, is doing the opposite. 
he starts by thinking about the physical, not the intellectual aspects of architecture, and he pushes them as far into the realm of sensory experience as, as it will go. Peter Zumther looks to he looks towards materials uh, and he calls um, uh, it, uh, for, he looks to them for an elemental knowledge, for the elemental knowledge that materials contain. He does this in the light of the belief that, and this is a quote from him, in, with, in the belief that postmodern life um, could be described as, as a state which everything beyond our own personal biography seems vague, blurred, and somehow unreal. He speaks of the world full of signs and information which stand for things which no one fully understands because they, they too turn out to be mere signs for other things. The real thing remains hidden. No one um, ever gets to see it. What, what gets my juices flowing, I think, is um, in the mindset of the creative impulses with those who are, who are driven by and have a deep empathy for, for materials. In understanding what motivates material artists, we need to first consider um, um, a way in which many of us uh, in the so-called technologically advanced society now experience a physical world. I mean, when you think about the way that um, the sensory ex experience comes to so many just simply through um, the large screen plasma TV, the computer monitor, or, the, or um, from, from gazing into a micro screen of a multi-functional um, cell phone, Communication increasingly um, happens, occurs digitally rather than face to face and in the flesh. Our bodies are her hermetically sealed off by glass uh, encased, triple glazed, climate controlled, and halogen lit apartment houses, schools, automobiles, and, and the such. So many objects we live with are synthesized, reconstituted with their surfaces, neoprene coated, plasticized, veneered, and laminated, um, creating materials that are so homogenized that they ultimately are unrecognizable. Um, although the DIY movement, that is the do-it-yourself movement and generation, is really um, um, at, is at the beginning of changing this, the ubiquitous wood shop and, and, and sewing room uh, and from basements of the past, it was in the spare room, have all, most have been replaced by entertainment centers um, contained the detritus of the digital age. When the physical world is experienced um, indirectly, removed second and third hand, uh, through the screen of a high resolution, resolution um, picture tube, you know, um, it's no wonder, not surprising, that the minute we, f we feel, smell, and see the real stuff in which the earth is made, um, the experience can be highly emotional. I mean, it's amazing when my, my I have students who have never made anything, who come to a, a, a college art program, and at times there's, a, there's an attraction, and a, a, even a, pulsion, a, a repulsion, a wonder, and awe, even a fear of the physical stuff in this world because they haven't had contact with it. And that's something really new in, in the world of, of, of art making, that, that that experience is happening. At times, um, we proceed, you know, we do, whether processed, synthetic, natural, or raw, the materials um, mean and how they are perceived today is very, it's a really exciting, I think, area of, of discovery. Um, um, so, anyway, um, and we, I think about how in the past, if you, if you ever read any of Lucy Lepard's writing, uh, and I, I don't, I'm not particularly attracted to her, nor I am to Marcel Duchamp, which is not attractive amongst art critics, um, in terms of, um, they, you know, um, 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 Lucy Lepard, Lepard talked about the dematerialization of art, and, and Marcel Duchamp spurned the idea that there was value in things being made by hand. Um, Arthur Danto, who's a really interesting art critic, um, predicted that the, 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 the demise of the art object. He talks about the, an observation and the, the, wor the work of visual artists is becoming so dependent on words and theory for its existence that in the end, <coughs> all that would be left is theory. Art and this is a quote from him. Art having finally vaporized in a dazzle of pure thought about itself and remaining as it were solely as an object of its own consciousness. Um, none of this has happened, and in, in fact, it appeared that over the last decade, all disciplines, whether, I mean, out, it's amazing how um, many media outside of craft are, are, are being attracted to material-based phenomena. Um, and there's a, a preoccupation, um, you know, there's, many have been drawn to material-based media as relief from, from a preoccupation with words and with language. Um, author um, Libby Lumpkin reinforced this tendency in her essay called The Redemption of Practice, where she recognized that artists everywhere are making things again, uh, asserting their materiality. Over the decades, she believed that there was a, a backlash to conceptual art being spawned by studio artists themselves through, through what they made. Um, Lumpkin saw arts 
uh, art, um, so artists abandoning those theoreticians who reside in the world of liberal, liberal arts, those who discredited the power of objects to directly communicate both emotionally and spiritually. Um, Lumpkin says that nearly 30 year hegemony of art constructed solely of liberal art, and art of the mind, is the, this whole area is coming to an end, she thought. Not coincidentally, art critics and historians and theoreticians have, are fretting over um, a vague and ill-defined crisis in, in their discipline. Um, an exhibition at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles titled Thing, um, not long ago, reinforced Lumpkin's early thoughts, showing work of emerging sculptors and, 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 uh, and material artists that show a reinvestment, again, in objects employing material-based techniques. Curator Christopher Miles now sees the work of, um, of LA artists as a partial move toward um, and away from performative and environmental um, architectural and installation approaches to sculpture with a new emphasis on the handmade and the custom and the decline of more conceptually based practice. Other profile exhibitions have been happening um, around the country and around the world. Um, and where the, the return to materiality and to objects is, is beginning to become the focus. The uncertainty of objects and ideas um, was, is a, is a, is a, uh, was an exhibition that happened here uh, at the Hirshhorn. And it's difficult for me to keep a straight face when I read um, Anne Elgood, uh, who was a curator. Um, she talked about, you know, at, almost, almost Johnny come lately about the idea that, that a counter-revolution is happening in studio practice. Um, um, and she's talking about emerging sculptors. She wrote that artists in, in this exhibition um, share a fundamental uh, desire to create objects that exist within three-dimensional space, extending beyond the scope of the practicality into the realm of haptic and the subconscious. Um, in an increasingly digital age, there are artists giving us something tangible rather than, rather than streams of data or images captured with light and mirror the world around us, presenting to their audiences freestanding objects uh, that we can imagine grabbing hold of, moving around, or backing up into. I mean, this is, this is a fairly radical kind of move in recent kind of art thinking. Their sculptures embody physical exertion. I mean, the fact that that's mean that uh, there's evidence of actions composing, building, constructing, stacking, bending, connecting, um, you know, adoring, um, adorning. These artists have come to, uh, to a reality of, of, of real things. Um, uh, David Abraham, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I know I'm mentioning a lot of books, and I'll, I'll get off. I'll get off this discussion and start showing work and talking about these artists. But I think there's a lot of writing that I that I'm, I think is important to to talk about. And David Abraham, um, who who um, is a writer and philosopher who's examined very eloquently and written about the pre the pre literate world um, as as a way of uh, gaining insight to the present. His thoughts and words are extremely relevant, I think, now in a discussion about materiality and the role of instinct um, and the subconscious and how they play and what we do. Artists, you know, artists who thrive in their creative work um, through an immerse, um, immense attraction and deep um, empathetic relation to, to the physical and do so through a need to infuse um, through imaginative projection our psyche into objects and materials. He wrote, a, he wrote a, a book called Spell of the Sensuous. Remember that, Spell of the Sensuous. It's really an interesting book that, um, where he talks about a variety of things. And, and what he said, uh, and it's a quote from him, he said, for thousands of generations, human beings viewed themselves as part of the wider community um, of nature, that human beings lived uh, not alongside, but existed within the natural world, participated directly not only with other people, but with animals, plants, natural forms, including mountains, rivers, winds, weather patterns. So-called primitive people truly inhabited the earth and shared an active relationship and feeling to that world. Um, that, and, and, and I mean, they, they genuinely, you know, his ideas about what went on then is they felt alive and, and animate and connected to just, just so similar to the way that when artists involved in material, um, uh, this area of material studies are con connect with materials in a way that those materials are not dead meat. They are alive and active and animate and, they, and there's another relationship that we have to those materials that, um, that, um, that others don't, I think. Abraham draws on the work of a uh, French philosopher, uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, who thinks of perception in terms of reciprocity, that is, um, an ongoing exchange between our bodies and the entities that surround them. He, he talks about um, 
uh, Abram talks about a silent conversation that I carry on with things, a continuous dialogue that unfolds far, um, far below my verbal awareness, and often even, and this, this is an attempt that I think, an attempt to de describe the ineffable. Um, often even independent of my verbal awareness as when my, my hand readily navigates the space between these scribe pages and the coffee cup across the table without having to think about it. Or when my legs hiking continually attune and adjust themselves to the varying steepnesses of, the, of mountain slopes behind this house without my verbal consciousness needing to um, direct those adjustments. Whenever I quiet the persistent chatter of words within my head or the white noise that's surrounding us here right now, um, you know, I, 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 um, I find this silent and wordless dance always already going on. Um, this improvised duet between my animal body and the fluid breathing landscape that it inhabits. Basically what he's talking about is the way, is the way that, again, that the craft and material artists have always understood this deep and meaningful kind of relationship between themselves and their physical world. To get a, broad as, a broader understanding of what, um, how materiality means to students around the country, I was, when I was on the board of the American Crafts Council not long ago, I volunteered to, um, to <clears throat> interview 25 uh, distinguished artists and teachers and mentors around the country um, and just to kind of get a sense of who was, who, th these are artists, uh, teachers who had a really close working relationship with students. I wanted to know what, um, what the, the pulse and understand the mindset of emerging artists in all craft-based media. And um, I wanted to know what they were thinking, what they cared about, um, and what was in the air. And the question about the use of materials um, among emerging artists, we discovered, not to, not to my surprise, that uh, there's greater interest now than ever and, and, and gravitating towards materials more because of their cultural value. Than, than, than oftentimes because of their inherent working characteristics. That's a dramatic shift in the way that, that many artists are thinking about works. I mean, not that they're not concerned about how materials act to create, their physical qualities that act to create objects, but also how that material has meaning in their lives. For example, um, this includes non-precious, impure, visceral materials with great attraction to ingredients which are psychologically volatile. Hair, skin, and anything that references the body um, it's fluids, it's various functions, often materials that attract and, or, or repulse simultaneously. We found great interest in, um, in the way materials and material objects are perceived as they reflect feelings about family, about domestic life, about gender, about place, about politics, about historic ev events, about modernism, about scientific discovery, and any anything having to do with the human condition. Precious materials like gold, silver, or fur um, are attractive and will, will be used not only because of their inherent beauty, but often, um, because, often to infuse the work with a content expressing ideas, for example, about so social uh, status, threat to ecology, animal rights, etc. Use of materials which are not durable, which are ephemeral, or short-lived or especially attractive towards, towards emerging artists. And I see that, see that with my students all the time, like food, waxes, latex, styrofoam. Um, and stuff that finds itself in our landfills, recycled materials of all, all kinds of debris which are normally viewed as disposable and non-precious are, are, are incredibly exciting in, among students who are, who are in art schools these days. In fact, a faculty member from UC Davis that I spoke with I mean, said basically that our students, um, when examining the use of materials, have turned into cultural anthropologists. Let me, um, let me talk about some of these artists now. Um, this is um, Kristen Morgan, Morgan, who um, is a ceramic artist who received her um, who received her MFA from uh, Alfred, and um, it teaches at California State University at, at Long Beach. Beach. Her use of ceramic materials is very different from what we traditionally associate with ceramic arts. Often, often we think of ceramics as refined perfection of kiln-fired clay over glazes, but she has taken her knowledge of clay and become an, an alchemist, concocting a new surface um, out of a mixture of clay, cement, and glue. For Christian, clay has become a skin um, applied over an armature of wood and wire, making the object appear to be in the state of decomposition. For Christian, clay is dirt. It is the most fundamental of materials, and she has allowed this primordial earth to permeate her psyche, resulting in the creation of, of a rotting hulk, this one about 15 feet long. Crafted with great care, says, says Kristen, but appearing as if it were dredged up from out of a lake somewhere. She's built a number of these large-scale corroding sculptures. Um, 
and more recently fragmented animal figures. The thing is identifiable as a 59 Cadillac, where this haunting yet elegant object appears to be larger than life relic of some ancient civilization, yet at the same time recognizable as an iconic American automobile emerging, emerging from modern times. These decomposition, decomposing monster objects can be felt bodily. When you walk around these things, you, the physical scale of them kind of really affects how you perceive them because of the physicality. I enjoyed um, a reaction to her work, which I think comes out of an art blog where Morgan's car was seen as work from a, this is a quote from a blog, is work coming from apocalyptic post-carbon emissions world where the planet we destroyed in turns uh, destroyed our fossil fuel burners. Kristen um, talks about them being built um, to be shown in a few venues, later dismantled um, and um, reusing whatever can be salvaged. Um, they're like stage props, good for uh, short-term short theater, and then they simply go away. This is uh, Carolyn Latham Stifel, uh, who's a, um, um, an undergraduate and graduate work in studio arts um, uh, in fiber and mixed media, um, and pro programs that emphasize the interdisciplinary um, approach to the visual arts. She's an artist who draws upon her own domestic experience, being a wife, a mother, and living in the Philadelphia suburb. Her work reflects cultural critic Lydia Matthews' observation that the rampant appropriation of craft by artists who may not have had training in this media is something we're seeing a lot of these days. Um, what is shown here is her installation it's titled Patch. It's at a, at a gallery out in, um, in, 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 um, in Seattle um, um, called Tsunama. Um, where she's or she uses um, uh, materials um, utilizing ordinary mundane textile materials, often discarded stuff like dry cleaning bags, fruit nets, um, uh, pipe cleaners, and a whole range of things that are cut into patches which are sewn and pinned to, to wire. Um, <clears throat> She uses seemingly innocent materials associated with home-grown craft and domesticity and create these environmentally scaled works, which she, re she refers to these things as parasitic architecture. Carolyn's obsessive accretion and buildup of materials has also been, been uh, compared to like a toxic bloom an atmosphere um, uh, materialized and transforming. This work may be seen uh, as lyrical and even playful, and at the same time cr creating a fearful and kind of deadly viral growth permeating and, permeating and seeping, uh, a word she really likes to use um, throughout these spatial webs. This is the second installation she did in Montreal, and you sort of walk into the gallery, and there's that little um, that little peephole through there, and then you sort of like walk around the corner, and this is what this is what you see, um, and it's an exhibition which explored the concept of of immersion. Um, that, that is where you walk into a space, and suddenly you're suddenly you're surrounded by an environment of of of, of this of suspended um, materials, almost like walking into an aquarium. Reminds me a little bit of Judy Pfaff, if you know the sculptor Judy Pfaff, who kind of was one of the first to really do installation kind of works. But um, um, she, this is a, a, she did a number of things that relate to, to this approach. Um, this is someone I think, uh, uh, Nick Cave, who I think is, I, I think probably most of you have seen his work. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's being seen everywhere these days, which is really exciting. He's an old friend from Cranbrook. We were in graduate school um, at, at different times, but our alums of that place, and he's, a, um, but I, I want to talk about him as a, um, in terms of his background, which really influenced, you know, what he, why he uses the materials he uses. He was uh, the youngest of six boys raised in the late 60s by a mother in rural Missouri. He credits his mother with kickstarting his career by her enthusiasm um, <clears throat> and encouraging her son's interest in making all kinds of um, works, handmade cards, and by modifying hand-me-down clothing, he inherited, inherited with his six older brothers um, money was often short in the household, which required him to make things out of materials um, found around the house or in local, local thrift shops and picked up at garage sales. Nick went to the Kansas City Art Institute, um, <coughs> where he studied textiles and fibers, and then to Cranbrook Academy of Art for his graduate degree. While in Kansas City, Nick um, also became interested in dance through Alvin Ailey program. Um, which he established there, and although he was not interested in, in devoting himself to dance exclusively, he began to consider the possibility of making dance part of his art. Shortly after uh, landing a teaching job at the Art Institute of Chicago, where he is now, 
Um, Nick um, made his first sound suit, and, and that's what this thing is. He made a sound suit similar to see to what you see here, found um, uh, from discarded uh, twigs uh, from Chicago Grant Park. And it's interesting, um, it was at a time um, um, when he, he was feeling especially vulnerable, right after the racially motivated beatings of Rodney King by members of the Los Angeles Police Department. That incident, said Nick, is when I started to think of myself more, and this is a quote from Nick, he said, I started to think of myself more and more as a black man, as someone discarded, devalued, viewed as less than. This is when he talks about disguising and camouflaging his psyche inside a garment whose cover is saturated with rich layers of loosely attached debris, sticks, feathers, bottle caps, used pencils, twigs. Um, for Nick, the materiality of the sound suits uh, became an identity altering, identity altering second skin, hiding beneath um, where the outside world cannot identify gender or color of the person wearing it. When these things move in space, um, when they're worn, um, they incre create incredible sounds. Um, Kay began to perform these works where um, the movement of his body active, in fact, many times is him uh, modeling these things. The body activates materials creating sound and transforms the materials into a my myriad of images. Materials used by Kay, by Kay are disposable, cast off, they're a metaphor for a society that perceives, as he says, um, the way black men are seen as indispensable. Hundreds of sound suits have been made um, over the years, and um, these are some of them, again, of, of old socks, old discarded, all kinds of materials, um, uh, synthetic um, fibers, uh, nat uh, natural hair. This is, this is, this is uh, Nick wearing one of the sound suits. He shows these things as static sculptures as well. I mean, one thing, you, you can't look at these things and not see them. Uh, I, mean, they sh I should be showing a video of this because that's when they're seen most, uh, most effectively. This is a, a, a young Korean artist, a fiber artist named uh, Sang-wook Lee. Um, he was born in Korea, and um, he draws upon his own personal biography as a source of meaning in the, in the, evolution, in the, in the making of his, his sculptures. He has chosen food as a visual and tactile reference, and often builds monumental curved walls um, um, related to architectural forms. He uses thousands of bricks of Raymond noodles to build these, build these works, which he negotiates a donation from a manufacturer. This is um, uh, of, of the noodle of noodles, so that the squirming chaos can be seen as frozen texture, the front side kind of back side. But some pieces have been made of faux faux Raymond noodles, where it actually takes cotton threads and mixes it with like uh, Elmer's glue and water and creates this kind of solid block of Raymond noodle looking like material. Um, <clears throat> it's important, to, but you know, understand the important thing though about this work is that. Um, 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 it's, he's drawn to Raymond not only for its aesthetic qualities as a material, but also because um, of the way that he relates to this in terms of his earlier life experience and the strong cultural overtones of this ubiquitous food stuff. I mean, there's often humor as associated with Raymond noodles just because it's a way that college students seem to survive on limited budgets, at least in the United States. But, you know, it's, it's history is interesting because... Um, of the way, you, when you think about rain, dry noodles uh, and understand how low-cost way of warding off hunger for working-class people, people, and it was invented in Japan, and then later used in the Korean conflict, after the Korean conflict, to kind of save people from starving. I mean, that's all part of what the of what he thinks about when he makes this kind of work. Um, they're the actual Raymond noodles, and he, he, there's some seven thousand blocks of these things used to make these objects, but. Um, he, he's interested in cross-cultural experiences, and, and um, he constructs and you, uh, this, you, these uniquely what he thinks of as American-built um, sculptures, um, uh, ruins in the Southwest. His earlier art tr art training in Korea was really quite um, quite traditional, um, using tapestry making and printed textiles. But he now, um, you know, uses ephemeral materials and builds these these kinds of things. Um, and uh, even though his work has an overwhelming physical presence, it's very different in terms of um, limited lifespan and marketability. This is a, a former student of ours in the University of the Arts. Her name is Claudia Crisson, and actually she showed here at the Searchlight um, thing, the exhibitions they used to have at the, at these, at, at the, here in Baltimore, part of the ACC shows. Um, but she has a, uh, had a, ma um, has a, a master's, um, was in the master's program in jewelry and metals at the Royal College of Art in London. 
Um, she traveled first. It's interesting. I met her in 2002. She came from Romania to us, and she first was a fibers major and then at University of the Arts in Philadelphia, and then she became a, a metals major, and then she began to mix things. Um, <clears throat> she represents a new breed in the field of craft-based media and material studies, um, where rather than remaining um, loyal to a single media, she, her interests lie a, a, in a true hybrid mix. At first, Claudia worked in textiles and fiber and then moved to metals, jewelry, while constructing costume, creating performances, and doing all kinds of stuff. Um, she continued these strategies in graduate school, but added work in three-dimensional computer printing and experimented with um, ephemeral materials. But Claudia's work is extremely subjective, coming out of a powerful emotional sensibility. Usually it relates to sort of some personal experience that she's had in her, in her life when she makes these things. Um, it's, it's, you know, the body is almost always a site of her rumination with material and process, and it's, and it's a catalyst in the generation of ideas. This piece is called Autumn in London. It's a crocheted head covering um, and, and was first made at the Royal Co College of Art, and she refers to it as, as the metaphor creating spiritual shelter, a hiding place where I could observe and not really be seen, um, driven, by, driven by the novelty of all that was happening in my, my new life. This is a piece she did at the very end of school called um, Fire Veil, made, a, made at the end of her time at the RCA. It's similar to the first piece, but now it creates a veil of separation. She says um, this also refers to uh, the social element of the Muslim veil, a symbol which entraps the woman figure, grounding it to the heaviness of earth and society. This is, this is Claudia herself <clears throat> in a piece called, she called Ligeti's Autumn in Warsaw. Uh, it's a crocheted piece in the shape of an, an actual size of an ear made with finely knotted sewing thread and it reads, it almost reads as, as a coating of the, uh, of the ear. And she talks about it as a metaphor for a way of filtering the sound of thoughts and ideas infusing us from the outside world, uh, from, the, yeah, from the outside world. This is a piece called Romance. You know, like I said, it, it's always related to something happen that's happening in her life. And it, um, um, and with romance, wax petals were applied and grew into, into a shape surrounding and hugging and sheltering the body. This was a performance piece created around the time of her wedding. This is a show she had at the Royal College of Art called Taste Me. It's a neck piece made of spun sugar, which is exhibited at, at the RCA and available for consumption by the audience at the, the evening of the opening. And it, it lasted throughout the duration of the ex exhibition um, and eventually uh, it turned to this. And she talks about this work as being something of the ridiculous gallop of life, the need to, of a constant novelty which dehumanizes. This, this is her comment, dissipating us into the vanity of, of the, president, the present. But then, you know, she does this kind of work and then she does this kind of work. I mean, she has this amazing sort of uh, double way of making. This word is, this is a garment and, and the attendant uh, um, jewelry elements called Blush, which is part of a project launch, launched by the Costume Society of the Royal College of Art at the, at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, she showed, I show this because what's amazing about her is she does that more conceptually based work and then she does this, this work and um, at, the, at the end of her time at the Royal College of Art she won the, uh, and she's an extremely competent jeweler, she won the best young jewelry designer of the year um, in, uh, 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 in England um, just before she left and um, like I said she showed a searchlight here I think two years ago. Um, totally other way of negotiating in the world. This is a, a young artist named Jonathan Brilliant, and um, he's based in South Carolina, and he doesn't have a particular grand philosophical idea or underpinning in his work. He's a university-trained artist, an admitted obsessive compulsive, who makes, he says, I make my work is situated around visual phenomena of patterning and mark making fused with the use of pre and, pre, pre and post-consumer um, uh, manufactured materials. He relates a lot to the British um, approach to installation, like the work of Andy Goldsworthy, but only, uh, but rather than working from whatever natural materials um, are immediately available at hand, Jonathan grabs whatever manufactured materials um, he can find um, in quantity. For him, the modern landscape is a local coffee shop with paper cups, paper coffee cups, plastic lids, and ordinary 
uh, many hundreds and thousands of wooden, these are all wooden stone, wooden coffee stirrers. He loves the idea in, of, of the, the itinerant artist traveling throughout the United States and abroad, and he's made these volumetric ephemeral um, objects in, in many places in, in the US, Berlin, London. What's amazing is these things are made with no adhesive. They're basically simply taking these stirrers and simply interwe interweaving them um, in a way that, um, that, that, that they create these la lacy diaph diaphanous walls. So in the end, they just, the whole thing just kind of collapses back into, um, back into um, um, the original materials and reuses them. A brilliant, I don't, you've probably seen um, this um, artist's work. He's an amazing African sculptor and textile artist named Ellen Etsui. Um, he has over, overwhelming, overwhelming material and haptic sensibility, I think. Um, and his work is being seen throughout the world uh, now. Um, he's from Nigeria and born in Ghana, um, which is home of a, a rich textile culture. Um, his work has been, sh been shown uh, symbolic and um, it shows much about the symbolic and signifying potential of cloth. Um, although his work reflects the history and the spirit of Kenta cloth and the Ashanti people of Ghana, it also has other important references. Ellen Atsui is a sculptor and textile artist who draws upon um, <clears throat> the social and cultural history, history of his country, which is really important to him. Um, you know, using discarded metal debris, including li liquor bottle caps, evaporated milk tins, aluminum wrappings from the tops of bottles, rusty metal graters, old printing plates gathered from the home, his home in Nigeria, uh, where he has lived for the last 28 years. Um, Ellen Atsui, meaning, um, Ellen Atsui, meaning is embodied in materials on many levels, not only providing critical commentary for some of the social ills, including al alcoholism and liquor's connection to slavery economics, and also on the adverse effects of consumerism and waste that have plagued his um, country for generations. However, his sense of materiality also expresses, expresses transcendence. The originality and striking beauty of these elegant architectural quilts is derived from scrap, uh, is, is profoundly symbolic as a source of uh, renewal. Here, here you can see where bottle caps are squared off and stitched and with fine copper wire to become jewel-like elements. This is, um, this is a 20 by 30 foot piece he and his studio did for um, the Palazzo Fortuni and the Venice Biennale, the, the Venice Biennale about two or three different times ago. Um, he explains, cloth is to the African what, mo what monuments are to Westerners. His sculptures emerge and grow as metaphorical textiles out of, out, out of African material culture and ultimately are monuments in themselves celebrating a new beginning. I photographed this last um, spring at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York who just purchased one of these works. Um, which is just this massive draped, uh, and, and you, this is a detail of the crushed and, and, and interconnected elements. This piece is called Bleeding Takari. Um, one thing I think, it, it, Susan Vogel at Columbia University spoke um, about the powerful material presence and scale when she was at the, at the Venice Biennale. What she said about it, um, and which gave it a sense of beauty, um, that it was different, she said it was different from anything else um, that she had seen there, uh, 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 mostly because it was not pessimistic. She said, you trudge past images of ruination and cynicism and arrive at uplift and resolution. And this is what she saw in that work. Um, I'm continually amazed that um, a single thread and groups of threads can um, can have can morph into uh, volumes and be be a source um, of expression, evoking a, evoking a highly kind of emotional charge. This is uh, we, um, in weaving threads may be stretched, you know, along a single plane to become figurative or abstract in terms of like tapestry or, or figurative weaving or any, any number of textile objects. Um, Chiharu uh, Shioda weaves black yarns into, into this kind of hectic, hectic array um, th that seems to take over entire galleries in this highly personalized objects which are become cocooned in that, in that thread. Um, here in Berlin, um, this Japanese artist ensnares a grand piano around the skeins of, of, the, un which, of, of the unconscious. When Shioda was nine years old, um, her neighbor 
his house burned down. The following day, the artist saw um, a charred piano amongst the ruins. This instrument has, uh, has lost its sound and has haunted the artist and inspired various works for years. Um, the work is titled Sounds of Silence. Last year, I photographed some of her work at a, at a New York gallery. Um, and she takes many of her own personal objects and sort of and um, sort of creates this filter of of, um, of this of this kind of black sort of foreboding uh, material uh, simultane simultaneously to impart a fear of death and vigor of life through ordinary objects. And an installation she did where she she asked for, for um, donations of shoes that had special meaning, and each shoe has a message that sits inside the shoe, and all the sh the shoes are connected to threads that all connect to a common point. This is an artist who, whose work I found recently, who I'm, I'm fascinated by. He's an Italian artist named Maurizio An Anzeri, and he's another artist who takes. Um, takes a single thread, a uh, sewing thread, and sews, he sews embroiders basically on vintage photographs, garnishing the portraits, creating an often haunting psychological aura. These um, incredible interventions using ordinary embroidery, embroidery techniques pierce and penetrate the photograph with needle and, uh, and, and releases, it seems like it's releasing something of the psyche of the subject that it's being, that's being embroidered upon. Um, some, some have referred to this work as sort of as photo sculpture. I think because the way the embroidered image is profoundly, almost it becomes a physical mask. It seems to have grown out of the person hiding and revealing what is underneath. Um, some, sometimes it feels like, um, I don't know if you can see this very well, but these are all small scale photographs. But it really has amazing intervention of, I mean, it's not just, not just decorating the photograph with threads, it really feels like it has this incredible um, connection with something within the psyche of the artist who's being um, um, embroidered upon. Almost, and sometimes almost feels like, well, and, and at times he deals with, he, um, he works with, in fact, Richard uh, Burbridge is a contemporary photographer and he'll, he's worked with, with him in making, the, making these images it really feels like the, the, I mean, it really feels like the brains are somehow pouring out of the, the ins, interior. Um, again, Maurizio and Zeri. There's a whole new, renewed interest in embroider, embroider, embroidered images on, on photography that I've been, been seeing. These are also interesting. Um, the second last of the artists I'm talking about, have you seen, I don't know if you know Orly Genger's work. I photographed this. The um, 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 Mass MoCA Museum of Contemporary Art, um, Massachusetts Museum of C Contemporary Art has a lot of really interesting exhibitions, and this is part of an exhibition called Material World last year. And one thing about uh, about Orly Genger, she's not hesitant or subtle, and I don't think I've ever been to, uh, photo I photographed this work there, and, and I've never um, walked through work that I've experienced sculpture in a, such a physical way. I mean, this stuff is bot experienced almost bodily because of its sheer physicality and sculptural mass. Um, the, uh, they're knitted and painted pieces. Uh, this is called Big, Big Boss, this installation. Um, it pulsates, I mean, it assaults you with its redness. I mean, it's painted red rope. It flows across these old mill floor galleries in Massachusetts. Um, someone called it, you know, a, a tsunami of tangled webs. It's also important, which I'm fascinated by, because of the. Uh, I'm, I'm from Maine, and this, um, these works are all, have all come to her through. Uh, the fishermen are, are required by law recently to replace all rope that they use that wouldn't sink to the ground of the ocean, to the floor of the ocean, which made a huge amount of um, material available. Uh, in fact, I taught a course a haystack last summer, and we used about 500 pounds of rope. We found their local dump uh, for making for making things, but. Um, <clears throat> this, this ruling it, uh, you know, made it possible to find an amazing range of materials. This is a, a, we actually have a show in Philadelphia right now of a few pieces of her work. This is at, um, at Indianapolis Museum of Art in 2009 where these colossal piles of monochromatic crochet planes were, were kind of made. These are just layers and layers and layers of massive rope woven or, I mean not woven, uh, either crocheted or, or knitted planes of, of, of fabric. Here, here, in a funny way, this is her, that tall column to the right. She's kind of um, um, poking fun at, at the often brutalist, minimalist art of the 60s. 
uh, through these pliable planes. This is this is at um, um, it's a piece called Mr. Softy as installation uh, at the Aldridge, Aldridge Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, it all comes. It all comes out of craft. The interesting thing. It all comes out of craft tradition. It all comes out of um, craft materials, and, and, and involves an effort which is obviously sheer ambition and a boggling labor intensity in, in terms of making what she makes. And the last artist, last but not least, the artist I'm talking about is um, is Dave Cole. And do you know? Have you seen his work? Any of you out there? Do you know his work? Um, I mean, he's been around for a while, and these things have been, but um, this is a work, I mean, he, he called, it's a word, the word extreme is what Dave Cole calls the knitting that he has been doing over the last 10 years, and he's, um, since his graduation from Brown University, he learned, he learned knitting um, one summer from a teacher who taught hyperactive kids to knit. Um, he was being hy hyperactive himself. Um, he never thought that, that he would have the patience to learn, but he did, and it became a way uh, to pay attention and focus during lectures at Brown. Um, in Fiberglass Teddy, which is shown here, Cole has undermined the stereotype of the ubiquitous cuddly play toy by knitting the teddy bear in a nightmarish scale, causing, um, using caustic materials, in this case, fiberglass insulation, in making these things. He does a similar thing with, with lead teddy, um, creating another horrific um, teddy, this time um, knitting a toy uh, to real scale with his hand-sliced poisonous lead ribbon. Um, Cole says, a basic element of my work is that I am subverting the feminine process, but more than that, I'm subverting the masculine material. Often the piece gets read the other way around, but that's not my intention. It's more like I'm opting, uh, co-opting the domestic process to say something about masculinity. Um, he loves to build monuments. Um, this is another piece of ma mass, mass mocha. Um, and he's, he's, he's a, a, a kind of drama queen, if I could say that, um, obviously. Um, and he builds these large scale objects and he got a, a grant to do this at mass mocha. Um, He devised uh, a, a, these, these um, two heavy excavators designed with specially um, made uh, knitting needles to, to knit the American flag. So that's it. Um, any questions? <laughs> if I can hear you. And I know it's not work necessarily that is directly related to things out here, but it, but I, I mean, I actually think it is, but um, a lot of it's a lot more ephemeral than maybe some things that we see here, but uh, nonetheless, they're, I think, come out of the same impulse. But. <laughs>